We are going to be back in Acts chapter 19 today, and uh, I don't know, maybe you've seen this trend. I typically will read a passage from the Bible and then explore uh, its implications with what the rest of the Bible has to say on that topic. I think it's a good way to consider uh, what the weight of God's Word would have to say in regards to anything, uh, that we wouldn't just limit ourselves to just kind of that one window uh, upon Scripture. Uh, So we're going to be looking at these two brief events in Acts and then look at the implications of what that means. And one of my goals today is that it will actually result in us kind of rounding out some of our theology when it comes to the supernatural. Okay, so maybe, maybe you're already in the place where you're one who believes that God exists or that there was some uh, intelligent designer that created the universe that we're in, okay? Uh, Maybe you're you're at that point. Maybe you've even uh, come to the point of believing in angels uh, and hopefully the biblical version of angels and not just like the the naked baby kind of angels, right? Uh, And there's actually another category of, of spiritual being that's at work in the world, and it sometimes is unusual. We don't often give much attention or detail to this, uh, but it will allow us to understand and answer questions as to why uh, the world that we're in, although it gives glory to God and although there are good things that he's given us to enjoy in this world, it answers the question as to why this world sometimes seems less than friendly, why there are things at work in this world that Uh, seem contrary to uh, the existence of just this good and all-powerful God. Uh, Because if if God was the only category that I had for the supernatural, I would then at times struggle with reconciling what I'm experiencing or seeing in this world with that character, with his nature. And so sometimes if we don't allow ourselves this category of uh, the demonic, okay, it might actually result in frustration towards God when I don't understand, right, why is this happening? Why why is God doing this to me or us, right? We might actually uh, blame him for something that he is not part of, okay? Uh, So so it's a a healthy thing for us to consider. Uh, Like I said, we don't give a lot of attention to this. Uh, It's good to be aware of, uh, that we wouldn't be ignorant of the schemes of this enemy, Uh, But in contrast today, we're going to see God's nature, God's character, God's heart as compared to the will of one who is against you, the adversary, okay? So so, uh, if you're already just kind of like, man, this idea of, right, Satan and demons feels silly to me, I understand that feeling, okay? But the Bible describes this. And one of the strategies of the enemy, uh, at least in the culture we're in, is in deceiving us of this idea that maybe he doesn't exist. If we don't believe there is an enemy, uh, we then won't be at odds against him and he'd be free to use his tactics. Okay, so uh, so here we go in Acts chapter 19. Uh, Here we go. It says, it's talking about Paul. He's on his adventures. Uh, I believe he's in Ephesus. Uh, He just uh, encountered some individuals and and prayed for them, uh, baptized them, laid hands on them. They end up getting these gifts of speaking in tongues and prophesying this really cool stuff. And then let's see what Paul's doing in Acts 19 verse 8. And uh, hang on. I'll have the verses on the screen. We're going to be going through a lot, but I'll, I'll cut it if need be. So, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. Uh, They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Uh, And in your Bibles, that the way is probably capitalized. It's referring to Christianity, right? This idea that Jesus is the way, right? The way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so that's what it's talking about, that they're opposed to the ideas of Christianity. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia 
heard the word of the Lord. So a couple of points about Paul. Uh, he spoke boldly about the truth of Jesus. He argued persuasively. He viewed Christianity as something that could be logically deduced from historical events and the evidence that he had, right? So Christianity wasn't just like Paul saying, guys, but you gotta believe in God, right? Come on, guys. Like, no, 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 he was persuasive by pointing to evidence, okay? Uh, and then also notice this, that some people rejected the things that Paul proclaimed, but everybody heard the things that he proclaimed, okay? So that's, that's the win for us. We want everyone to know about Jesus and what he's done for them, and it's not on our responsibility how they may respond at this point in their lives to that message. Okay, so, so we want everybody to come to know the hope that right, they can have in Jesus, but we realize that not everyone is going to be happy about that at all times in their life. Okay, so <clears throat> as a result, in verse 11, it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. All right, these are unusual miracles, special miracles. Granted, miracles in general are going to be... Uh, abnormal in some regards to begin with, okay, but these ones you'll see are a little bit weird, okay? Uh, it says, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that, he uh, that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So that's unusual, all right, that's unusual. And, and uh, although I would uh, want us to desire, right, a spiritual life like Paul, right, that right, he wants us to pursue the supernatural in at least the capacity of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right, with the appropriate boundaries, because there are these evil spirits as well. Not all supernatural experiences are good ones, okay? Uh, and Paul was, right, praying all the time and praying for others and planting churches. I'd want us to desire to be like Paul. I don't want us, however, to put Paul on this pedestal of like, man, like Paul's anointing was incredible. We're just like, the idea of just like a, a Kleenex that touched Paul is then casting out demons, that's crazy. Because the Bible fortunately is telling us this, that God was the one doing the miracles. All right, it wasn't Paul. That Paul being used was equally as impressive as that Kleenex being used, okay? So like the power wasn't in Paul, just as the power wasn't at work in the Kleenex apart from God, okay? That the handkerchief <laughs> and Paul were both merely being used by God at work. And Paul would advocate for this as well because there were times in which, right, they healed the sick and then people are like, wow, the gods are here, they're among us. And Paul's like, we are not gods, we are just ordinary people like you, okay? And so apart from God, you and I are, would be as effective as like some snot rag at curing a cold, right? So like, I just want to point out, like, let's not try to pursue, right, these kinds of miracles. Let's pursue God. And that's what Paul was doing, right? He was preaching the gospel and then God did the miracles, right? Paul wasn't out trying to like find all sorts of like weird ways to do miracles. He wasn't this miracles centric ministry, he was a gospel-centered ministry. And as a result of the gospel going forth, God is showing up and healing people and delivering them from, yes, even including evil spirits. Okay, so now watch this in contrast. Uh, verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. So it has not put these people in the category of followers of Jesus. They were followers of the Old Testament. They hadn't yet trusted in this Messiah. So they didn't know Jesus. But what's interesting, though, is nonetheless that there's these like traveling Jewish ghostbusters that are just like casting out demons and, and they're willing to try anything. Okay, so they don't even believe in Jesus, but they're like, hey, let's give it a shot. Let's just see if this works, okay? And so they would say, in the name of, G of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Okay, so uh, just in terms of like the main theme of this whole passage, right, this whole passage, this whole sermon today, I want you to know Jesus, 
okay? Uh, I don't want you to like go home and then you maybe encounter some difficult situation and then you go to pray. Uh, I pray to the God that Brian was talking about today. Like, that's not great. Like, I want you to have a relationship with God. I want you to know Jesus, right? Don't just have some, like, secondhand Jesus that you pray to in times of need. I want you to know who Jesus is. And also, like, if you don't know Jesus and then try to, like, once in a while, get God's blessing and favor sprinkled on the life that you're leading apart from him, uh, it's not going to work out great. Uh, so yeah, let's see what happens here. So verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. So seven brothers uh, going around casting out demons, and they're like, hey, what about that Jesus Paul preaches? Demon, you should come out of this person uh, from the name of Jesus or something, right? And, and one day, the evil spirit answered them. Okay, so these uh, evil spirits are not synonymous in the Bible with just any sort of disease, okay? We don't believe that all those who are sick are, like, possessed with demons, okay? Uh, But they are sentient. They can communicate, okay? And uh, the work that they're doing in the Bible throughout is not a good work, okay? They're, They're oppressing people. They're causing all sorts of uh, unhealthy situations. But this is interesting. The demon recognized, right, they're praying in the name of Jesus, but something was off. He says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Right? The demon themselves, himself, recognized that these people were forging a check. Right? They were using Jesus' name, but had no authority to do so. Okay, so it was just like, wait a minute, like, who are you? Like, I know this Jesus fella more than you know this Jesus fella, right? And like, you're trying to cast me out in his name? Like, you don't even know this person, right? And and it's interesting that he knew about Paul, right? Because Paul's doing massive damage to the uh, kingdom of darkness as he's proclaiming Jesus and planting churches. Okay, and so then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So it didn't work, okay? It didn't work, all right? Praying in the name of Jesus while not knowing Jesus isn't going to be effective, okay? Uh, So this is not the situation that they were hoping for, but what they had heard about is that Paul was preaching this Jesus And right, that demons are being cast out in the name of Jesus, even with like an apron that Paul touched, right, that demon just couldn't handle the presence of God, right, that that they were being cast out. And now they try the same thing apart from knowing Jesus and fail uh, miserably. And the the demon knew that they were phonies, okay? Uh, So what I want to point out from this passage is that God and his angels are not the only spiritual forces at work in the world. Okay. Uh, And that's actually going to be helpful for us to understand uh, so that we don't blame God for things that he's not doing. All right. It's going to be helpful for us to realize this. And and like I said, I don't like giving a lot of attention to this because we're all about the glory of God and the work that he's doing in our lives. But we're also in our work of going out around and doing good. We want to see people delivered from this sort of oppression. Right? We don't want to see people enslaved to sin or in bondage and oppressed by the demonic. Okay? So like, you could imagine this as like this today, this sermon is like a briefing making you aware of an enemy and their tactics so that when you go out into the world, right, you're ready to encounter and face situations like this. All right? If right, you do in fact encounter those situations. Not that you should just be like, it's snowing out, that must be a demon. Like, Nah, like don't blame everything on a demon. And uh, also just because there's a category of God and his angels and the demonic doesn't mean that sometimes the mess that we find ourselves in wasn't just caused by us. Okay, like when I choose sin in my own life and those consequences come on me, I can't be like, I'm under attack by the devil. Like, no, you might you might have done that to yourself sometimes. Okay, and fortunately, the word of God will challenge us to walk holy lives unto the Lord, right, to be free from this past of darkness that we have experienced. So, so a couple of uh, names for the devil, okay? Uh, One is the God of this world, 
All right, uh, this is in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He says, uh, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. All right, so the Bible describes the enemy of God, right? The adversary of us as the God of this world. All right, that he is at work in this world. He has some amount of authority in working in this world. Now, he's not an equal force opposite of God. Don't think that at all. But he is opposed to the kingdom of God. He's rebellious to God and his will, right? And, and he, in one of the ways he works, is in blinding people from the truth. He's a deceiver. He's a liar, okay? And, and well, in contrast, we see that God's work is in revealing truth, in sharing light, okay? In, in right, letting people know Jesus. In uh, Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses of sins. Paul's writing to Christians here. All of us, okay, were previously living lives where we were dead in our sins. We needed to be brought to newness of life in Jesus. We needed to be forgiven, okay? So, but notice it does say past tense. So this isn't something that we as Christians should keep doing, right? No, we were dead in those sins in which you once walked, past tense, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. All right, so before we encountered Jesus, we would have perhaps liked to think that we were just autonomous, that we were in control of our own lives, we were doing that which we chose to do, that we weren't going to be restricted by God and whatever moral commands he had for us. When in fact, what felt like freedom, we were just following the course of this world, we were following someone else. That we thought we were free, but we were blinded. We thought we were in control when in fact we were enslaved to the will of someone else. Okay, so, uh, and that spirit is still at work in this world, not in the lives of believers. All right, that, that spirit, that prince of the power of the air can't even touch a believer, okay? But he can be at work in those who are not yet uh, protected, right, under the kingdom of God. Okay, so uh, Lord of the Rings reference. Think about this. Uh, all right, it'll, some of you will catch it and then others you just ignore me for 10 seconds. All right, so think about like this, this deceiver at work in the sons of disobedience, right, where people think they are free but they're following someone else. That's like Sauron, that was the bad dude in Lord of the Rings, deceiving the free peoples of Middle Earth where he created these rings of power that pleased their desires, and while they thought they were free, they were in fact following and yielded to the will of one who sought their destruction. Okay? All right, bam, we're, we're back, back in the Bible. Here we go, all right, all right. Man, that was close, we almost, whew. All right, so, so this evil force is not at work for our benefit. Okay? He's, he's not like one that you'd be like, man, but, you know, Christians I know, they're not that cool. Sometimes they're lame. But, man, the devil, that guy's cool. Right? Like, no, 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 that's not a great idea. Uh, the contrast I would have for you is like having loving parents who want the best for you versus like a drug dealer. Right? Where you're like, but the drug dealer sometimes gives me what I want. My parents are all like, no drugs. Right? And like, the drug dealer's kind of cool. My parents aren't. Right? Like, that's how you might think that at times, uh, right, that, right, maybe God might feel restrictive at times because he sets boundaries, but they're for our blessing and for our good. And in fact, this foe is more than happy to give you things that you think you want when it's in fact placing you in slavery. And uh, so in terms of this foe, uh, he's really, really not that cool. Uh, he is willing to stoop to like very low levels, to destroy the most vulnerable, to do the equivalent of what we would consider war crimes. Okay, uh, that he and his kingdom are at work destroying even those who are unaware of what's taking place. Okay, that, uh, look at this passage from Mark chapter 9. There was once this dad who brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus and his disciples 
to be set free. And in this passage, Mark 9, you can read it on your own, but Jesus asked this question of the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. All right, this enemy I'm describing is willing to bring harm to kids. All right, he's like, he's not like, well, that wouldn't really be fair. No, he's more than happy to stoop to that level. Okay, so like just in terms of his uh, hatred of humanity, he's willing to even bring about suicidal and self-harming tendencies in children. He didn't consider them off limits. He wasn't just aiming for mature believers, okay? He's willing to attack anyone, all right? And what, yet in contrast, notice Jesus, what he says here. He says, uh, or this father finishes saying, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. So Jesus is at work in bringing deliverance from oppression, while this enemy is at work bringing about slavery, oppression, right, possession in this case, uh, and destruction even to those who are children, right, even to those who are children. I think about like, because as a school teacher, I see kids sometimes with just like all sorts of cuts and wounds on their arm that were self-inflicted and not indicating by any means that they're necessarily possessed, but they're absolutely believing some form of lies being told to them by the enemy. They are created in the image of God. They are precious in his sight, right? God loves them and wants to see them free, but yet they've found themselves in some oppressive situation where they're causing harm even to themselves. Right? Like, that's the type of work that this enemy does. This enemy is one who was at work in Egypt in the book of Exodus when the decree went out to kill all of the male children of the Israelites. Okay? This, this enemy was at work in the pagan worship of the god of Molech in which people would offer their children burning alive, right, in worship to this false god. Right? This enemy was at work in Jesus' day when Herod sent out the decree for all boys under the age of two to be killed. And this enemy is also at work in our generation in terms of right, just abortion and the destruction of those who are weakest among us. He doesn't consider any target to be off limits. Okay, So like in terms of like our perception or other people's perception of like, But yeah, but Satan's the cool one. Like, I want to just hang out and party in hell or something. Like, that's not at all a reality. And it's a part of that blindness that he has promoted. And so as a result, once we allow this uh, to round out our theology, this idea that there's this one who's opposed to us, an adversary, right? We realize, like, God's not the one causing this destruction and oppression. All right? God is the one who brings life. Right? God is the one who brings freedom and forgiveness. Right? God is the one who results in us no longer being under this bondage of condemnation. And so, but when people ask the question, right, why does God allow suffering or why does God allow evil in this world, right? one of the reasons is that the, the force of that evil, the cause of that evil is one who had brought their own will into the universe that was the first will that was opposed to God and his kingdom. It was the first will that was in rebellion against this good and loving God. And yes, God does momentarily tolerate that evil, right? You might think like, well, why doesn't just God in his power and his goodness just be like, nope, gone, right? Like, just get rid of him. Because at the same time, God would have to deal with me that same way. Okay, that like the moment I have a covetous thought or a prideful thought or a lustful thought, right, God would in his justice be completely right and just like taken me out. But yet God is patient even with my evil, right, allowing me to be drawn to repentance and freedom, right, that that, that is why he allows this for the moment. But be assured that there will be this day of judgment. God's not going to tolerate this evil forever, okay? And he, in fact, uses this world in the state that it's in to draw people to himself, right, to set people free. He uses even that which is meant for evil for good, and he's not the cause of it, right, but he allows it because 
That was the only way for free will and love to exist. He had to give us the opportunity of rejecting him in order for our following and accepting him to be authentic. Okay, so, so that's what he does, momentarily tolerate that, but I'm so thankful for his grace and his goodness that he's not just taking me out the moment I have a thought in rebellion against him, right? But he is kind towards us, right? Making us more and more like him over time. And so, so I want us to recognize that the enemy's work is one of oppression. Well, God is in this business of, of freedom, of deliverance from slavery. It says this in Acts 10, 38. This was Peter preaching. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. All right, that when you think about God, don't be like God's the one that's causing sickness and death and disease. No, all right? God is in the business of bringing the dead to life. Right, healing the sick, delivering those who were oppressed by the devil. All right, so like when you need to think about like why does God allow this or is God the cause of this situation that you might experience, think about the life and ministry of Jesus who perfectly imaged the Father, right, who showed us God's heart towards us and towards the world, who went around delivering people from this kingdom of darkness. Or in uh, John 10, 10, Jesus said this. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come, or I came, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. All right, God is in the camp of giving you life. He is not stealing, killing, and destroying. Okay, that's, that's what God's business is. And then in terms of how far he's willing to go to give life, Right? Jesus said, right, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Okay, so like just the contrast of character is worth pointing out here. All right, so there is this enemy that's at work, and in contrasting him to the heart of God, it's, it's completely obvious. First uh, Peter chapter 5 says this. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties, all of your cares on him because he cares for you. Okay, so notice the heart of God. God is one who cares for each of us. So much so that, right, he is the God of all comfort. He's the source of comfort. He's the source of healing. All right, and he wants us to come to him anytime we would have something in which we are grieved, right, that we would cast all of our cares upon him. But notice then, in contrast, verse 8, all right? Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Okay, so the intent of this adversary is for our destruction. Although he may offer us things that our hearts may desire at times, okay, it isn't because he likes us, all right? He's trying to destroy us. So, one of the things to be aware of is that Peter, when writing this, doesn't just say like, so just make sure, right, just pray for God's angelic protection over your life or something like that. He actually places some responsibility on us to, to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, right? That, that we would be <laughs> under his authority. Or in terms of how we react to this adversary, he says to be sober-minded, right? To not allow our minds to be influenced even by substances, even though I don't think that's what he's specifically talking about here, okay? But like that we need to be alert and aware and not allow ourselves to fall under this potential deception from the enemy, all right, that we are to be watchful, we are to resist him. All right, some of the warfare against this enemy I described last week in Ephesians chapter 6, right, this idea of that we are putting on the armor of God, that we could stand against every, right, temptation, that we could stand against every, uh, that we could catch the fiery darts of the enemy with a shield of faith, sort of thing like that. So there is this amount of responsibility that we have, 
uh, that we are, like I said, the evil one can't even touch us. But if we choose to leave God's kingdom, or not in full capacity, but to leave the safety of God's kingdom, leave right parts of our lives open to and exposed to the enemy, it may be something that he might attack, right? So like we just need to, need to be aware of that possibility. Okay, so one of the ways that the, the enemy does attack though, because like I said, he can't, he can't touch us, is by attacking those things which he knows with which we are equipped. All right, like an enemy that might uh, besiege a city and cut off all supply to that city and starve it out, or when an army is going into a nation and that the opposing army may cut off their supply line to food and ammunition, right, that, that one of the tactics of this enemy is to cut off our resources with which we are equipped, okay, and that significantly being the word of God. Uh, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 8, describing the four seed parable. You'll have to read it on your own, but he's talking about someone is scattering seed is like the word of God being shared or preached. And he described that our hearts respond to that in different ways. Now he's responding to those who, uh, or describing those who reject the word of God in this case, but I want to point this out merely so we are aware of this tactic that the enemy has. He says, uh, the ones, all right, the seeds sown along the path, are those who have heard the word of God. And then he describes that these birds came down and snatched those seeds away. He says the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. And with what intent does he do that? So that they may not believe and be saved. That our, the enemy recognizes that the word of God is the means through which right, our faith is built, through which we are equipped. And he may intentionally try to sap that resource from us so that we will not be fully aware of his tactics against us. Okay, so like he views the word of God as being this incredibly powerful source for us and he knows that if he can separate people from that, that he's got some means to have an amount of victory. Okay, so, so he uses that same strategy with us as believers that any amount of, of our not being aware of what God's word says on a matter or right, any amount of deception or lie that he can suggest, even though we might still be saved, right, he wants us to not be equipped with the full word of God. That's the strategy that he used in uh, even the Garden of Eden when tempting Eve, right, he said, Right? Did God really say that? Right? Or, or surely you shall not die. He brought into question the word of God. Okay? Because he realizes that's something that exposes God's goodness, God's glory, God's love for us, God's plan for us. And the word of God exposes him and his strategies. Right? So if he can cause us to not believe something that's true in any area of our life, right, he knows that he has a root and a foothold to be at work. One of the things that he will use as a strategy in churches is to distract us from the truth of the gospel, okay? Uh, where, I mean, he'd be thrilled if we all got distracted on this idea of just like our own good works save us, right? Like, yeah, he'd be thrilled about that because it would be a distraction from what Jesus did on the cross on our behalf, right? Our good works aren't the thing that saves us. Or, or in this case in the church in Corinth, Paul wrote a letter, uh, he actually wrote a few letters to the church in Corinth, and he addressed this church issue that was potential to cause division, right, and uh, destruction from the enemy uh, at work in this church. One of the things he realized was that uh, there was this sexual sin that was being practiced by this man in this church in Corinth. Uh, I know this gossip is probably really late getting to you guys. It's like 2,000 years old, but it's still really juicy. Uh, but, right, Paul then addresses this and is like, hey, why isn't your church dealing with this issue, right? As long as you live in this tolerance of, of perpetual sin amongst you, right, that's going to bring harm to that individual and to others in the family of God. Right? So Paul actually told them to like, confront that sin, correct that sin, and if the person refused to turn from it, right, to actually to separate themselves for a season from them. Okay? And then in uh, 2 Corinthians, he actually writes back to that church, talking about forgiving this person when they repent. Uh, at least it seems as though, by implication, 
that it's describing the same situation. I suppose it could be another situation. But he says this, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So think about, like Paul is mentioning this idea of addressing sin in a healthy way in a church community, and then he's talking about the tactics and strategies of the enemy. Like what sort of thing would the enemy have gained by the church not dealing with the situation in a healthy and right way? Right, like I said, if, if he was able to deceive this church into walking into a, this false tolerance or this idea of sin, right, not being addressed, right, he's ensuring that more believers are enslaved to sin. But similarly, what about how they receive the person when they come back? The church easily could have walked in judgment towards that individual even once they repented. And that also would have been a way for the enemy to gain a foothold and cause division in the church. It would distract us from the gospel, right? That no, this person is truly forgiven, right? This person is truly forgiven, like accept them back. Like Jesus said about the prodigal son to celebrate every time someone walks in repentance and comes back into the family of God, right? That's the way we should respond. So like the enemy actually has this strategy on either end, either of ignoring the sin or either on the end of addressing the sin, but forcing condemnation on an individual when God wants them to walk in freedom and forgiveness, Okay, so like Paul's pointing this out, like, listen, like the enemy is at work and even that situation in that church, right? That, that there's a way that he could gain some amount of victory for his camp. And so we do have this enemy. He is crafty, but I want to point out that he is weak, all right? He is not an equal and opposing force to God. All right, so not, not at all. Uh, and uh, so as a result, you can imagine his tactics, because he's actually already been defeated significantly, he's already been disarmed. I'll read some verses in a moment, I hope. Uh, and he knows that there's this deadline coming, okay? And as a result, his tactics right now would be as if uh, we delivered a city from an enemy force, and yet maybe there are some soldiers for that force that are still using guerrilla tactics and underground sort of strategies that the, the war is definitely over but they might still try to use means to sabotage the work of right, God in that city, right? So, so uh, just be aware, that's the type of strategy. They have limited resources, they've already been defeated, but the tactics they use might be in information warfare or things like that, of, of just causing deception, is what the Bible's kind of describing. And like I said, there's already this deadline, this day of judgment that they're looking at is coming. When Jesus encountered a demon-possessed man, the demon actually said this in Matthew 8, 29. They cried out and said, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? All right, that even the demons realize, like, they are on a limited schedule. Okay, like, there is this day of judgment, right? That even hell, the Bible describes, was designed for the devil and his angels. It wasn't meant for humanity. Okay, but they recognize that they're running out of time and they're defeated. Their strategy is going to be different as a result. In, in 1 John 5, uh, John says this. He says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born uh, of God, right, God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. All right, so we don't need to be afraid of this foe, Okay. And verse 19, and we know that we are from God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So this is kind of an interesting idea. Like the Bible describes, even post Jesus' resurrection, that the world is actually under influence and sway of this enemy. He can't touch us, okay? But the world and its system is under his influence. Okay, so we, like we shouldn't have the expectation that the world will always be this good and perfect place. That's how God made it, but since the fall, it's been far, far less than that. Uh, one of the strategies that the enemy uses is, is temptation. Okay, uh, we see that uh, Jesus, even before his earthly ministry, Jesus was, was tempted. 
in a variety of points in the wilderness. And one of the things that the enemy did was said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll, I'll offer you all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, that he's, he's trying to tempt Jesus with his shortcut route to avoid the cross, to avoid his own suffering, right? And still like, hey, hey, just worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Okay, that that's one of the strategies that he used. And Jesus at that point didn't correct him as to whether or not he could even offer the kingdoms of the world. Okay, so like Jesus wasn't like, you don't have that. Like, no. Like in some ways, the enemy, like I said, does have authority and is at work in this world, right? Now, God is sovereign. God's in control, but we need to be aware of that. And one of the things that, that happened in that passage is, is after Satan tempted Jesus, it says that uh, when it failed, essentially, that he left until an opportune time. Okay, that one of the things we need to realize is that he has limited resources. Temptation, whenever you or I face it, is not like this perpetual, never-ending thing because that's one of the lies we might believe and then be like, well, I might as well just give in to temptation because otherwise it's not going to go away. That's not true, okay? That's not how temptation works. Once he realizes he's failed, he's not going to send his resources to continue to tempt you. He's just going to be, oh, I'll come back later when maybe I can get you at a weak point, right? Uh, it says this in terms of temptation for us to be aware because we also don't get to just like blame Satan, anytime we do something wrong, because that's kind of what Eve tried to do. In, in James chapter 1, verse 14, it says, But each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desire. Okay? And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Okay? So, like, the things that we're tempted with are things that we are already attracted towards. Okay? We might not all be tempted by the same thing, but this enemy is more than happy to bait the hook with whatever you'd like, okay? So, like, like, so don't think like, but man, but God doesn't give me that, and I really like that, right? That doesn't mean that he's on your side all of a sudden because there's a hook with the bait on it, right, that you happen to be attracted to, okay? So he might be tempting us in that way, but really we can't even just blame him because it's our own desires, all right? Even in the heart of a believer, Right? We have to be aware that we will at times be at odds with the Spirit. We have these, as it says in Ephesians 4, I'll go right here, these deceitful desires. So Paul writing in Ephesians, he says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So one of the things we need to be aware of is that even our own desires might at times be sabotaging us. Okay, like that's not something that we can blame the devil for. That's something that in our own flesh that we have. One day we'll get new bodies. We won't be tempted in the same way. It'll be in agreement with our spirit. Okay, uh, let's see. One of the things that we do in response to the enemy, I'm going to be skipping some verses here. Ephesians 5 verse 11, Paul says this, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. All right, so like, like I said, I, I'm not, I don't enjoy preaching a sermon about the enemy, but I do want to expose his tactics so that we wouldn't fall prey to them, right? I, I don't want us to have wrong thinking about like, well, maybe this desire that I have, God gave it to me, and maybe I should pursue that. No, no, we, we each have deceitful desires in our hearts, right? And we need to expose them, whether in our, right, the actions is like, that's obviously wrong, or, or even like just preaching about something like these deceitful desires in our hearts, talking about the fact that a, a prideful thought, right, a lustful thought, right, coveting or jealousy or all of these different things, right, we need to be aware that these are going to be enticing to us and we should expose those sorts of things. But what matters, what is most significant, is not like me equipping you with like, this is how the enemy works, guys. This is what you've got to be aware of. What matters is knowing Jesus, okay? Because even though like the seven sons of Sceva, they might have been like, well, this is how the enemy works, right? A devil exists. We've read the Old Testament. We're familiar with that. We've seen them cast out in the name of Jesus. They might have known all of these tactics, but apart from knowing Jesus, it was useless. It was useless. All right, Jesus said this in Mark 16. He said, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. 
right? In my name, they will cast out demons, right? They will speak with new tongues. He keeps going. But I just want to point out that the authority we have is not our own. But we do have authority over the enemy. And the way we access that authority is by our being a part of the kingdom of God, being made children of light, right? Being those who believe in what Jesus has already done. So this enemy isn't one that we need to be afraid of, right? But we need to be aware of his tactics, right? And, and Jesus went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil when he was empowered by the Spirit. And that's likewise what he wants us to do, to expose the darkness, right? To, to set people free. That's what he desires us to do. Let's have the worship team come back up. And I'll read this last verse, 1 John 4.4. 4. I didn't get through all of them, but I got close. It's all right. It says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Okay, that, that Jesus has already defeated this enemy. Okay, we don't need to be afraid. Right? They've been disarmed, they've been exposed, they've been put to shame. Right? And we, we can just recognize that in Jesus, the enemy can't even touch us. Right? But we want to see other people set free. Right? We want to see other people know and experience right, freedom and forgiveness from sin. Right? Jesus described and Paul described that sin is, is slavery. Right? So, so whether you're someone who hasn't yet trusted in Jesus, I encourage you to trust in Jesus this morning. And if you're a believer already, then I encourage you, believer, do not submit yourself again to the yoke of slavery. Right? Don't willingly go to this prisoner of war camp and just place yourself in handcuffs and then sit down in this prison cell. Right? Like, don't do that. Put off the old self. No longer walk according to the world or in the ways of darkness. Right? Walk as children of light. Right? Make yourself pure as Jesus is pure, as the Holy Spirit is sanctifying you and setting you more and more free. Right? So if God is stirring in your hearts and you're realizing there's areas that maybe you have tolerated or surrendered over to the enemy, right? bring that back into the light. Confess that before God even this morning. Here, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you love us, that you died for us when we we're your enemies, uh, that you care for us, that you forgive us, and, and Lord, you want to see us set free from sin. And so, Lord, I ask that uh, those of us who are burdened this morning, that we would cast our cares upon you because you care for us. I ask that those of us who are suffering would know that you are faithful and true, that a day of justice and judgment will come that we don't need to be afraid, that we don't need to think that maybe our suffering is, is a result of what we've done, but Lord, it's just a part of this fallen world. I pray, God, that you would equip us today as we encourage each other, as we pray for each other, that we would be able to go into this world, that we'd be equipped for every good work, and that we'd be able to see people in our community set free from oppression. And we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.